Redemption Hill, it's time to worship the Lord. Let's stand together.
Amen. Good morning, Redemption Hill Church. You may be seated. So good to see you this morning. So glad you came to worship with us today. Redemption Hill Church, we are one church in two locations. And in our aim, we desire to love God, make followers of Jesus who love God, live life together, and serve our community. And that's what we're all about. And so if you are a guest this morning, uh, I'd like to invite you to fill out a connection card. You can either do that by paper at the next steps table, or you can hit the QR code in the chair on the, uh, in front of you. And this way, we just have a record of your visit. Love to have a chance to get to know you. Also love to uh, have, uh, invite you to come to the next steps area here in the foyer. We have a gift for you at the end of the service. So come by there and we have a chance to uh, see you get to say hello. And uh, once again, just so glad that you could be with us this morning to worship. Um, anyway, we have an uh, exciting couple of weeks coming up as we are two weeks away from Easter. So next week, we have our Egg Dash. It's going to be a uh, Egg Dash is for the kids. And, uh, and so that's going to be taking place right here in the park behind the church. You can go to the church website and you can sign up for that or just show up and find all the details on the website about that. So that'll be next Saturday morning in the park right here behind the church, the Haynes House Park. And then as we look towards Easter coming up, the Millennium Center, we're really excited about that and just want to uh, give you just a couple of details about all that. And so Easter at the Millennium Center. So we have a parking deck downtown right beside the Millennium Center. Uh, there's plenty of curb parking as well. Parking is free, so there's no charge in the deck. Uh, so the parking will be free. It's right beside the deck as you come out from the parking deck, you're just right across the street from the Millennium Center. As well, uh, if anyone needs uh, handicap parking or access to handicap parking, you can register and reserve a spot. I think we have 15, 16 spots that we're able to reserve. You can reserve your spot. Then what you would do is you come to Millennium Center, pull up to the front, and then we'll have a parking attendant there to show you where your spot would be. As well, uh, if you are bringing your family and you want to drop them off, there'll be a drop-off area there at the front of the Millennium Center. Center. So we're trying to make it as convenient as possible to be able to uh, get in and, and also uh, get out uh, uh, there downtown. Um, a couple of other things. Obviously, we're going to have a full kids ministry going on during that time. And as well, just for uh, security purposes, there will be a uniformed police officer in a car there, you know, because uh, we are going to be uh, downtown. But man, we are really excited to be able to come together both locations to worship there at the Millennium Center. As we've talked about before, the Millennium Center is literally in the heart, in the middle of our city. It's in the heart of Winston-Salem. And so we're going to come with one location and we're going to worship the Lord with all of our heart from the middle of the city. And so uh, what I want to encourage all of us to be doing between now and Easter, one, let's just be preparing ourselves and praying for that particular day. And uh, I want to encourage everyone to be there at least a half hour early. And this is not just so you can get parked and get settled. There's that too and, and get a good seat. But what we want to do at all the members, we don't want you just attending and experiencing Easter. We want you to have a good time and want you to experience something. But we all need to see ourselves also as ministers on that day. And so we want everybody, all of our members to show up a half hour early so we can all be ready to welcome those who would come. We anticipate a lot of new faces being there, probably going to be their first time experiencing anything with Redemption Hill. And so we want to be there to be able to greet people, smile, talk, connect, and just extend the grace of God to people before the service gets started. That way their hearts are opening up to the gospel and, uh, and they are actually uh, ready to hear and uh, to hear the word of God that's going to be preached that day. So two things, let's all be in prayer for that day. Uh, just asking the Lord to change lives, change hearts, uh, that that day would be the birth of gospel movement in our city. And then as well, let's prepare to minister ourselves on that day to receive people as they come. So uh, those are the announcements. Once again, you can keep up with everything off of the website. Um, each and every week, we pray for another gospel-centered church in our city. We want to pray this morning for River uh, Oaks. Uh, church and their pastor, David Beatty. Uh, appreciate those guys. They've partnered with us. They've partnered with us, I believe, in the um, October prayer initiative when we pray for every household in uh, Forsyth County. And uh, so let's pray for them this morning. And let's pray and ask the Lord to bless our time together. So church family, join me as we pray. Father, we just want to thank you this morning and give you honor and just praise for your goodness and for your faithfulness. Father, I'm just reminded of the scripture, Lord, in the Old Testament when Moses says, is there 
any other God, any other nation that has a God who is so near unto them as when we pray and as our Lord is near to us when we pray. So Father, I thank you that in this moment, your presence is in this space. And we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy that you're constantly moving towards us. The Father, that you are generous with your faithfulness. Father, we ask that this morning, both here and at Hainstown, Lord God, and at Salem Park, Lord, that that you, Lord God, your presence would be in our services. You would be with Brandon as he preaches here in a moment, as he brings the word, Lord. And Father, we thank you for your presence. And we ask, Lord God, that you plant the seed of your spirit and of your word deep into our hearts this morning. So Father, we are ready to receive. And Father, we want to pray this morning for River Oaks. We thank you for that church. We thank you, Lord God, for their ministry in that area of our city, Lord God. Father, we pray that you would bless them that you would manifest your presence in that uh, church community. And Father, that you would continue, Lord God, to multiply their ministry, especially as their members, Lord God, are seeking to be on mission where they live, where they work, and where they play. Father, we pray, Lord God, for uh, our Easter services coming up at the Millennium Center. Father, we pray that over the coming weeks, Lord God, that your spirit would, would just go ahead of us. But Lord God, that you would prepare everything for that day, every detail. But Father, we ask that you would go by your spirit, you would begin to pull and to draw upon hearts. But Father God, that those that we would invite, the Lord God, that there would be an openness there to receive the invitation. And Father, we depend upon you. Father, we ask that you would move mightily during that service. Father, we ask as well that you would move mightily today. We love you and we thank you and we praise you. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. All right, church families, stand up and why don't you greet your neighbor this morning and just pass the peace. Let them know you're glad to see them here at Redemption Hill. Well, good morning. Uh, go ahead, take out your Bibles, turn to the book of Colossians as we continue walking through uh, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, through the letter to the church in Colossae from Paul uh, and to us. And, and this morning, um, out of the 95 verses that are in the letter to the church uh, at Colossae, we are in the final 12. All right, so congratulations, you made it. Uh, This is the last week. Next week is Palm Sunday and then Easter. And so we're going to get through the the rest of the the letter, uh, the book of Colossians uh, this morning. And I have 10 points for you. Uh, In all honesty, you'll see why in just a moment. I'll go through them pretty quickly. Uh, But 10 points this morning. I know we normally do like one or two, so that's a lot. So get ready. Um, But we need to get through these final 12 verses, and you will understand why there are 10 points in just a moment uh, when we read the text. Um, But we have been going over the last several weeks, and and throughout the book of Colossians, uh, we've talked about how chapters 1 and 2 are deeply theological. Paul really wants us to understand who God is. Uh, He wants us to know who we are in him, how his grace saves us, how he has done the work on our behalf for salvation, and not only that, but life. Uh, 
that Jesus pays our debt in full for our rebellion against him, but he also deposits into our account his righteousness. So there's no way we can place our faith in him and not be set free from our past and all of our sin, but also he has deposited so much into our account that we can never go get into debt again. And that's freedom for us to place our faith in him and live in liberty that he allows us to have in community with God as we were created to have it. Um, So Paul wants us to know, here's who you are in Christ before he ever tells us what to do, because who you are determines what you do. If you are seeking and you are trying to build an identity, then you will live a life of trying to seek and trying to gain and trying to pursue. But if we understand who we are in Christ and what he has done for us, that he came to live for us, to die to pay the penalty of our sin and to rise from the grave to defeat sin and death and therefore all that is defeating us so that we might surrender ourselves to him and by his grace through his work be set free, When we begin to understand that reality, then that in Christ we have everything that we need. We no longer have to live to gain, but we get to live out of what has been gained. We no longer have to live seeking, but we can live revealing who we are in Christ. And the typical way that we live life is we look at the culture and we try to build up a kingdom. But when we place our faith in Christ, we get to see his kingdom and bring his kingdom down. We have freedom to live as who we were created and designed to live, and that is the unbelievable grace of God. And we have tried to lay out very thickly just that we cannot underestimate grace. Uh, And so if you've missed any of those, the weeks previous of really walking through what the gospel means and what grace actually is, I would encourage you to go back because I don't have time. As I mentioned, 10 points. Uh, And so we're not going to really rehash everything that Paul has said to this point, but I do want us to understand foundationally before we get to any of the practicality, and this text is very practical this morning. It's one of the most practical texts you can ever read in all of scripture. But before we get there, we have to understand the foundation in which Paul is calling us to these things. Because if we just go and and say, okay, this is what the Bible tells me to do. This is the law of God. This is what it means to be a good Christian. Then what we will have a tendency to do is to go and think, I need to do these things to get the approval of God. I need to do these things to be a good Christian. And what we tend to do then is to go and try to purchase through religion and religious activity what Christ has already purchased for us in the cross and his resurrection that he gives to us by grace. Or we're not very good at doing these kinds of things. We're like, here we go. It's just more law in scripture. We totally miss the reality that God gives us the law for us to walk in the freedom of community with him. Like this is how we were designed to live that it's actually freedom to walk in Christ. Real slavery, listen to me, is living your life trying to gain favor. And real freedom is being able to live your life out of a favor that has been given to you by God, by his grace, that you cannot gain by anything that you do or lose through anything that you do because it wasn't up to you to get in the first place. And so in Christ... We actually have a freedom not to go try to save ourselves religiously and purchase what Christ has already purchased for us through religious activity. We get to walk in freedom of how he's called us to live. But we also don't have to look at the law and go, I can't do that. It's too much. God expects too much of me. He knows that. That's why he came and lived and died for you. He did everything that is required, and so you don't have to reject what God is calling you to do to go out and try to find in the world or in yourself what Christ has already purchased for you through the cross and the resurrection and gives to you by grace. So the gospel and the grace of God is the only way that eyes can come off of self and that you are not determining your own salvation and you are not trying to gain your own life and gain your own meaning and gain your own acceptance. But when you place your faith in Christ and you are saved by his grace through his work, 
then by receiving him and surrendering to him, you have now all of the acceptance, all of the love, all the forgiveness, all the peace, all the meaning, all the, the, the purpose in life that you crave. Everything is given to you that you need to have a satisfied life and all of eternity spending with your creator, all given to you through his work for you. And that grace transforms us. It doesn't leave us the same. When we are given a new identity, an understanding of who I am because of who Christ was for me, then it transforms the way we live, the way we think, the passions we have, desires we have. I want to know this one who has saved me. I want to be in community with God who created me to be in community with him. I want to understand in a deeper and deeper way that Jesus plus nothing equals everything, and in him I have everything that I long for. And so if I surrender to Jesus, I actually have all the life I crave, that in him I have everything. And that transforms us. Paul has been saying When we begin to understand that, we begin to become a people who can take off the old self, all the ways that we used to look for salvation. And we can take off pursuing to build a culture up, which turns us inward because sin and brokenness and rebellion turns us towards self. And the way we build up a culture and build a life and an identity in and of ourselves is that we have need. And we're doing everything to gain and everything to achieve. And we become jealous and we become angry and we become bitter and we use other people. And we have disunity and we fear not achieving. And we we are have anxiety over protecting what we have achieved. And we define ourselves by the cultural and worldly distinctives around us. But Paul says, in Christ, we're free to live as we were designed to live by his grace, through his work for us. Therefore, we can take those things off because we no longer have to seek and to gain. We no longer have to perform to become because Christ has performed for us. And now we can set our eyes on him. And we've talked about over the weeks that we actually perform better in life with greater joy when we focus less on our performance in life, religiously or irreligiously, and more on Christ's performance for us. So by looking to him, We actually live the life we were created and designed to live. And then Paul says when that happens, it transforms our hearts from the inside out. And who we are determines what we do. So we can take off the old ways we sought salvation and put on, he says, compassion. Because Christ has shown compassion to us. Love. Real love. Because we know the truth and we know the truth of Christ and how we are loved in him and what we can love towards. Kindness. Because of the kindness of Christ. Humility. Because we have everything in him. Unity. Because he is what brings us together. We no longer look at ourselves and define ourselves and build our cultures by the distinctives of the culture or the world around us. And we can accept others and forgive others. And so Paul says, put these things on and take those things off. And then last week, we saw four ways in which we can intentionally live in that new identity. And and Paul laid those things out for us. And here at the end of this letter, we get this long list of names, hence the 10 points, because there's 10 names. And so we'll go through them quickly this morning. But Paul goes through this list of people that he loves. He's writing to the church in Colossae, and he's going, hey, I love these people. I want to thank these people. I want to challenge these people in one case. I want to to honor these people because of the way that they are living out this identity. And these are things that we will find in the church, and each of us should be pursuing to surrender to and live in the truth of the identity we have in Christ. Because of what we have in Christ, Paul says, these things should be present in us. Not to gain, but because it's already who you are. He says, this is how you actually walk in freedom. And these 10 things should be present in our lives. And so Paul's going to encourage us, and he is going to challenge us this morning. So look with me, chapter 4, starting in verse 8, or 7, sorry. Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He is a beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent you to him for this purpose, that you may know how we are to be... um, He may encourage your hearts, and with him Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, 
They will tell you of everything that has taken place here. Aristarchus, may my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you may have received instruction, if he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is also called Justice, and we'll just call him Justice for the rest of the time because I can't imagine how confusing that was. It wasn't that Jesus, okay? It was a different Jesus, common name there, and that's why they had qualifiers to their names so often in the first century. So Jesus, also called Justice. These are the only men of circumcision, and so he's saying these are the only three Jews that are with me. So notice the people. Some of these people Paul is sending to the church. Some of these people the church has sent to Paul. Some of them are Gentiles, seven of them, and three of them are Jews. So notice what the gospel is doing amongst the people, the collaboration, the unity that God is bringing. Epaphras, verse 12, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you always, struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in the will of God. For I bear... Him witness that he was, has worked hard for you and those in Laodicea, which is a neighboring town, in Heropolis. Luke, a beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Give my greetings to the brothers, as in Laodicea, uh, Laodicea and Nithia, and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read to the church of Laodicea. And see that you also read this letter in Laodicea, and say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Okay, so when we read this text... I think immediately our first thought, if, if you're anything like me and you're reading scripture and you just get a long list of names, uh, you think, okay, cool. You read the first couple, you try at least, you butcher a few, and then you just move on, right? Like, why is this here? How in the world can we get a whole sermon out of this? I promise you I can do it. Um, trust me. Um, but how do we actually look at these things? Because typically it's just something we skip right over, right? Um, and we just kind of see the list and we kind of pick up a few and then we skip right over it. But there is a purpose for this. So why should we care about Paul listing the Colossian pastors and the deacons and, and the person who's hospitable enough for the church to meet in her house and the, the volunteers at the church and people that have come to Paul and have been sent from Paul? Why is he mentioning all of these people in the church and why should we care? Well, one, many of the lists in Scripture that list out names, it's actually tying Scripture to history, and it helps us trace the historicity of Scripture. And so we can actually gain a lot from the name list in Scripture. But here, there's also, I think, another purpose. Yes, it shows us some of the history, but in this case, we should care about this list for another reason as well, because I think this is Paul helping take everything theological, and he's really deep theologically in this book, and he's really laying out the gospel truth and how we should understand it and how we should know it, and here he really takes what could be impersonal, what could cause us just to kind of walk away and go, okay, here's all of this head knowledge that I know. Now I can really, like, really argue with anybody that I come across in the culture that doesn't believe in the gospel because I can really lay out the truths of who God is and who I am in him. And so he's taking this head knowledge and he's making it very personal. He's bringing it down to the street level of our relationships. And he's saying, hey, if we understand the gospel truth and it's transformed our hearts, the fruit of that understanding will be put on display in our relationships together. So last week, he's, he's saying to us, here's how this changes us personally when we place our faith in Christ internally. But now he's going, here's how it actually looks in the church Here's how it looks in the body of Christ, the family of God that he has brought together. And if real understanding of the gospel is being lived out through transformed hearts, then it'll be on display in our relationships throughout the church. So this is Paul relating to us in a unique way. And the reason we should care about these names is it doesn't only give us history, but I believe it also allows us to learn something about ourselves. This is to us. 
If this letter were to be written to us today, some of our names could be in this. And I know that's a big stretch and we're really dreaming, right? And I'm not trying to say this is, this is Paul's letter directly to us. It's definitely to these people. And that's why their names are listed. But we need to understand what Paul is drawing out of the people of God. And this is where it applies to us 2,000 years later. So what is Paul saying to us in this truth that we should live out in this new identity, the community that reveals the kingdom of God down and is not like the rest of the world trying to build a culture up, but we're revealing something that is far more beautiful than anything that we can find in the world. And and we're revealing in our relationships together and that our hearts are transformed that we don't have to go try to purchase in the world things that Christ has already purchased for us or purchased through religion things that Christ has already purchased for us. We can focus on him and find life. And that transforms, changes our relationships. And, and when we began to understand this and strive towards living out our identities in Christ, then the church truly becomes the most lovely place on earth, the most beautiful community. It puts on display everything that we long for and we get to participate in, but also everything that the world desires. And we get to put a picture to the gospel truth in the way we love one another. So this is kingdom down living. This is living out our identities. And with that said, as I mentioned, some of these people, and I want us to kind of see this, are actually sent from Paul. And I'll try to walk through these quickly. I'll try to tell you where they came from and, and, and what they did in their lives and what we know about them in scripture, because we see a great diversity here. Of seven Gentiles, three Jews, we see a a woman put in here that would be totally not something that would happen. Gentiles, Jews, women and men. Uh, Paul is saying, hey, I want to thank the church. I want to challenge the church. I want to encourage the church. And the church is all people who place their faith in Jesus Christ. And then we collaborate together and have unity centered around him. And it totally breaks the unity that we try to have in one another, with one another in the world that creates disunity unity with people who are unlike us, and this is where we see a beautiful picture of everything that we long for, and there's this collaboration that's happening between Gentiles and Jews and men and women and the church at large, sending people to other churches and and sending people to Paul to comfort him, and this is one of the great reasons in the gospel that we desire as a church body to collaborate with other churches in our community and all around the world. Because what God wants to do, he wants to do through all of his people. And I believe that's one of the small things Paul's pointing out here by including this list. He's going, we're not just all Jews. We're not just all Gentiles. We're not just all men. We're not just all women. God is bringing himself a people together to make a much greater community established on a much greater thing than anything the world has to put on display. And this is what it looks like for his kingdom to really be revealed on earth. And it happens in the church body. This is something that we should strive for. We'll see that a little bit more in these things. So quickly, uh, look with me. I probably spent too much time on that. But here's the first thing. All right, we'll go through quick. Tychicus. All right, Tychicus is a Gentile from Asia. So I want to give you kind of a picture from where these men are from and these women are from and what they're doing. He probably became a believer on Paul's missionary journeys, and we read about him in Acts chapter 20. And so he, Paul comes to know him. He comes to faith. He puts his faith in Christ. He's from Asia. And here's what we know about Tychicus. Paul trusts him greatly. Paul sends Tychicus with this letter to the church in Colossae, and so he's trusting that he is able to uh, be dependable enough to take this letter to this church. He also delivers the letter to Ephesians, the Ephesians letter to the church in Ephesus. He also is sent by Paul to Crete to take the letter of Titus, and and so Paul trusts Tychicus greatly. He knows that he is dependable. Later on, he also sends Tychicus to the church in Jerusalem from where Paul is in prison. Right now, he's in Rome, and this is where he's sending Tychicus to uh, Colossae from. But he also sends Tychicus to Jerusalem to take money from the Gentile churches to help the Jerusalem church. 
And so we see these enemies, and, and, I, and I don't have time to really get into it this morning, but just another visual of what the body of Christ is together when we are founded on who we are in Christ, when we have everything in him and we're set free from the things of the world, then it actually can bring love because we know love. It can bring forgiveness because we know forgiveness, compassion, kindness, meekness, humility. These things become naturally things that we desire to put on display, and it builds unity because I don't need to get anything from you. I, I don't have to use you to build a kingdom up. You're not taking anything away from me when you're unlike me. I can actually enjoy and appreciate the differences that you have from me. And I can understand that in Christ, I'm actually getting a fuller picture of who he is and his kingdom by us having community together and learning from one another. It builds unity. But if I'm trying to find my own identity in the things of the world, I'm looking to self and my own appetites and desires. I am always going to be seeking to gain and get more. And I will never not be able to use my relationships because I need more. I'll never be able to, to allow a difference from me to take away some of my value and what I find my life in because I'm trying to build my life. Only in the gospel are we set free to have this type of relationships. And we see that even the enemies in the first century, the Gentiles and the Jews, are not only helping one another, they're actually giving each other their money. They're caring for one another. They're loving one another. So Paul trusts Tychicus to do this. And so here's a couple of things that I just want to point out. There's, Tychicus is, is kind of the longest one. It'll take just a couple of minutes just because he has multiple things, and the rest of them just have maybe one. Um, but Tychicus is, is somebody we learn a couple of different things from. And the first is what I've just mentioned, that he is trustworthy and he is dependable. And Paul points this out not only to encourage Tychicus and to thank him and to honor him, which is a good thing when we see people pointing us towards Christ, to thank them in that. And Paul's doing that, but he's also telling something to the church in Colossae and through that something to us. That if we want to live out the identity of Christ that we have in him freely by his grace in the church body that we might experience the community on earth that we are created to have, long to have, and crave in our lives, and that the world needs to see, then there need to be some, some practices, some identity practices of us living out who we are in Christ because we have everything in him. And the first thing he points out is trustworthiness and dependability and faith. Paul trusted him to carry these letters. He trusted him that when he went, he would be able to answer questions from these churches, to be able to give testimony to what is happening in the missionary journeys that he is on with Paul, that he would be able to teach the church what scripture is saying, that he would be able to disciple people to walk with people, to help people. And so when Paul is, is entrusting Tychicus with the truth of scripture and these letters that he's sending to the church, he's not just trusting him to be a mailman. He's also trusting that Tychicus will be able to give testimony to these truths, that he'll be able to explain these truths, that he will be able to disciple people and walk with people when they come up to him and go, that's all great, but what does this mean? Or what does that mean? Or how does that apply to this situation in my life or this trial? Or, or what do I do with this situation? How do I pray about these things? He's trusting that Tychicus would be able to pour into this church body with truth and love to put on display the identity that we can have in Christ by his grace through his work. And this, listen to me, is a vital part of the identity that we have in Christ. We are, as the people of God, to be dependable and to be able to be trusted to deliver the truth of God to the world around us. This is critical for us as a church living out the kingdom of God down, bringing the kingdom of God into the community around us, loving one another, but also putting on display through the mission of God, the kingdom that everyone around us longs for so that we might have our greatest joy in the calling that God has given to us. We read all the way back in Genesis 1 and 2 that we were created in the image of God and he sends us out to have dominion over the earth and to fill the earth with worshipers. That's our greatest calling. We were created in his image to give him glory and to worship him. 
But we are created to reveal his glory in everything that we do. And if we're not doing both of those things, then we're not actually experiencing the joy of our salvation and the identity that Christ has purchased for us on the cross and through the resurrection. And, and we need to be able to depend on one another, not only to be able to trust one another, so that when you say you will do something, you will. When you promise something, it's actually a promise. When you say you'll give something, you actually give it. When you give a timetable, you actually do something within that time frame. that we're dependable people, that we're trustworthy people, that we're faithful to do what we say we will. But, but on a deeper level, the gospel also makes us dependable people to walk in our daily lives, putting on display the truth of God. That God is calling us and trusting us to be faithful to reveal him in everything that we do with everything that we have. That we would experience a great joy by being a people who are revealing the truth of God and able to disciple one another. This is what we need to be putting on display. This is what the identity of Christ gives us. Now, the hard work of Christianity is not us going out and trying to be trustworthy and faithful and dependable, but it's trying to rest in the reality that because Christ was faithful, Christ was dependable, Christ is trustworthy, and we find our identity in him, this is how we live out the joy that we have in him. That I desire what he desires. I desire his truth. I desire to put him on display. One scholar I heard say this one time. He said that your greatest ability in the faith is your dependability to rest in it and reveal it to others. This is what the gospel allows us to do, and this is the joy that we can have in Christ. I know that it can be scary. I talked last week about the word evangelism, which I know is a buzzword for us, scary word. Don't use it. It's basically a Christian cuss word for us today. <laughs> And I know that we live in fear of that, but listen to me, it actually leads to joy and all of us are evangelists. All of us came in this morning pushing a basketball team, <laughs> right? We want people to believe what we believe. We want people to think what is best, what we think is what is best. We want people to find value in what we find value in. It's all across the board in life. And when we actually understand who we are in Christ, then we want to reveal that. Now, we want to do it in love, and we want to be respectful with it, so we might be a little more respectful with it than we are about how you should cheer for North Carolina, right? But, but we want to reveal what we find life in, and as a follower of Christ, here's what we say, we've said this before, but discipleship and growth and joy comes in tension. We're constantly having to die to self to find life. And dying to self to actually find joy in life is very difficult for us. It's, it's tense. But so your joy actually comes in the tension. And here's what we need to begin to learn how to do in our walks with God. We have to learn to become comfortable in the uncomfortable. Or else you will not grow. This happens with anything else in life. If you just think about it, if I want to get in shape, I've got to be uncomfortable and put myself in positions where I'm pushing myself and I'm, I'm growing my muscles in tension. I'm growing my stamina in tension. And this tension and this uncomfortableness is where I actually become comfortable because I know I'm growing. So I want to go to the gym, I want to eat right, and it's hard and, it's, and there's tension in it, but I know what it's producing. And when we lean into Christ, it will cause tension. It will cause us to lay down ourselves, to find life and joy, but we can become comfortable in that as we understand that it's actually growing us, that we are depending upon him. And as Christ's priorities become our priorities and we are faithful and dependable and trustworthy to reveal him in everything that we do. And listen to me, dependability and trustworthiness and faithfulness is not something we typically find in the world. It's just not. Go to work. Look on social media. Talk to even your friends and your family. Dependability is something that is not common in a culture that is constantly changing, not only changing all around us, but constantly changing what it even believes and thinks we need to be dependable and trustworthy and faithful about. It's constantly shifting. It's hard to find, but if you look at the church, 
it should not be hard to find. If Paul was writing this letter to Redemption Hill Church, he should be able to put a lot of names in here of people who are trusting the identity they have in Christ and are faithful to reveal him in everything that they do. This is what the gospel begins to reveal in and through us. The second thing, and, and, and I'll go through this really quickly, but the second thing we see in Tychicus is that he is an encourager. That's what he says in verse 8. There are two kinds of people, and we all have a tendency to lean one way or the other. There are pessimists and there are optimists, right? And pessimists tend to be discouraging. Optimists tend to be encouraging, but, but sometimes, and we can't just say we need to all be optimist, because we can tend to encourage people to a fault and not encourage them to actually become better. So the optimist is just like, everything's okay, and everything is great, and it's all going to work out. And that isn't always true. Sometimes we need to tell people truth, and they need transformation, and they need change, and we need to be optimistically encouraging them that, that, that God can work in them, and God can transform them, and God can do a mighty powerful thing in them and through them, but we need to be able to point out the reality and encourage them towards the truth. So we need a little bit of both. But in the world, we tend to be one or the other. And Paul says that Tychicus is an encourager. And what that means is he understands truth and he loves people in it. He is constantly encouraging people, but he's encouraging them towards truth. That means he can say hard things to people. We see this in Jesus, by the way. I think Paul also does this really, really well. I think Paul was probably one of the hardest people in all of scripture. Like when I picture him, maybe not, but when I picture him, he's got a long beard, he wears a leather vest, and he rides a Harley. That's, that's how I picture Paul. And, but he always is like challenging us, but always encouraging us. When you read his letters, sometimes of the things he says, you're just like, whoa, but I feel encouraged. Like, I feel like he loves me. I feel like he's doing this from a heart of care for me and compassion for me. And this is what the people of God do. In the identity that we have in Christ, we're not just discouraging people. All of us know discouraging people, and all of us try to avoid those people. Right? And so we all know the person that just no matter what happens, they've got something negative to say. There's no place for that in the gospel truth and finding your identity in Christ. That, is a, that comes from a self-centeredness that's trying to put down to build themselves up. It comes from a place of all I can see is me, and all I can see is my comfort, and all I can see is my desires. Now, there are things that you might need to point out in love and encouragement because they need to, somebody needs to repent of something, or somebody needs to grow in something, or the church even needs to become better in something, or some, one of your friends needs love and encouragement to grow in the gospel truth and the identity that they have in Christ. That is absolutely true. But we also all know people that it's just like, no matter what, did you experience worship today? It was incredible. Oh, it was just so loud. Yeah. <laughs> right? Man, we had, we had 10 baptisms today. Wasn't that amazing? Mm, yeah, but I got to lunch late. <laughs> right? Like, we're having Easter in the Millennium Center. Yeah, but the parking, I'm probably not even going to come. You know, I mean, it's just like, no matter what God is doing, no matter what good might be happening, there's something negative to always be said, and that comes from trying to live culture up, not kingdom down. We can point things out in encouragement and in love towards the truth, but encouragement seeks to give life even in correction. Discouragement seeks to put down and to destroy, even in pointing out something that needs to be pointed out. As people who find our identity in Christ, we need to be dependable, faithful, trustworthy to reveal the gospel truth in everything we do with everything that we have. And we need to be encouraging people in truth and in love to point people towards the truth and help them to grow in that truth so that they might have the encouragement that they need to see the goodness of God and be transformed by his grace. Onesimus, we only see one thing about him. Uh, he's really interesting because he is a bondservant. You can read about him in the book of Philemon, uh, 
Philemon. He was from Colossae, and he came to faith with Paul, and now Paul was sending him back to the church in Colossae, where he was a bondservant, and he ran away in disobedience to the law, and so he would have been a complete outcast. He was the marginalized. He was the one that nobody would have wanted back. If he came back, he could have been penalized within the Roman government. He could have been imprisoned or even killed for running away from his duty as a bondservant. We talked all about that in chapter three, so I'm not going to go back into that. But this is really a test case, I believe. Paul is throwing out Onesimus. He's going, hey, I'm sending him back to you because he's come to faith. He wants to come back and make things right. He's repented. He's grown. He wants to reveal the gospel truth amongst his people in Colossae. So I'm sending him back. And it's really a test case for the instruction Paul gave regarding bond servants and masters in chapter three. He has this expectation that the church will forgive him that the church will love him, that the church would would look towards people who have done something wrong to them and desire for transformation in the gospel truth. And here's the question, how do we look at people who aren't like us as a church body? Are we revealing the kingdom with the people who God has put around us, with the people who might be coming into the church, with the people that we go out and see where we live, work, and play? How do we respond to those who have sinned against us? Those who have broken the law, maybe culturally or biblically or even legally. Those that don't agree with our political views. Those that don't have the same opinions of us about different situations in the society that we live in. How are we treating them? Not are they right or are they wrong, but are we loving them in truth? Are we encouraging or are we discouraging? I believe that Paul is pointing out Onesimus to us so that we can ask ourselves the question, the church in Colossae could ask themselves the question, does the gospel and our identity in him trump anything that we might have issues with in the world around us through cultural distinctives and the way that we think and the way that we process, or is the gospel identity that we have actually the foundational truth of what we have? So yes, we're always pointing people towards truth. Truth absolutely matters. But we're loving and encouraging people so that there's a platform for the truth and we're revealing the truth through our lives so we're not becoming bitter, but we're able to forgive. We're able to love and accept people even when they're not honoring God with their lives or making decisions that they should make that maybe culture would cancel out or, or legally they've done something that, that might make culture and people around them and living in a neighborhood a little bit afraid of them or whatever it may be, how are we actually responding to people around us that we should be responding to by pushing away if we're finding our identity in the things of the world? But because we find our identity in Christ... Our, our identity in him triumphs over every social economic distinction, every past sin, every cultural difference, everything that might cause bitterness and anger, or are we just like the world? Are we just a group of people coming together going, we, we all come together because we want to be religious people? That will bring disunity inevitably. Or are we all coming together because our identity is in Christ? And if that is the truth, then we will begin to love every single person and point them towards the truth. That means we accept them as they are. That's what Paul did with Onesimus. But he didn't just leave Onesimus as a runaway bondservant. He told him the truth. Onesimus comes to Christ, and then Paul does the really hard work of going, now you need to go back, and you need to make things right, because this is what it looks like to honor God and pour into the people of God. So we need to extend the grace that God has extended to us, to all people, revealing the gospel in every relationship that we have. And that means for us this morning, if you were to think just for a moment about any type of person, any, any way that somebody finds their identity in our culture, any other religious type of person, whatever it may be, somebody from the opposite aisle politically, if there's anybody that would walk into this place and sit next to you and make you feel uncomfortable, 
then we have to begin to ask ourselves, is my identity really in Christ? And how should I treat this person because my identity is in Christ? Because if our identity is in the things of the world, then you have an excuse to push them away. You're finding your identity in something different from them. You value things differently than them. And to give in to that would, would, would pull away some of the value you put your identity in or they put their identity in. But when your identity is in Christ, you have everything in him. Now you desire to reveal that in everything you are with everything you do in every relationship that you have. And so we look at people completely differently. We forgive. We show compassion. We show humility. We show kindness. We reveal the kingdom. And we want them to know truth. So we always point them to truth. We're not just accepting We're loving and encouraging towards the truth, and it's so unnatural. It's absolutely unnatural, but it's what the gospel does in us, and the gospel truth is worth everything, even uncomfortable situations, to reveal the love of who we are in him. Mark is the one who wrote the gospel of Mark. He was cousins with Barnabas. We read about him in Acts chapter 15. He actually walked away from the faith, but he came back. And Barnabas discipled him as he had discipled Paul. And as he discipled Mark, Mark transformed his life. He repented and turned back to God. He went on various mission trips with Barnabas, and he, and he walked on mission trips with Peter. Uh, and Peter, actually, John Mark, is just giving the account, the testimony of Peter. That's what the Gospel of Mark is. It's Peter's account of Jesus and the discipleship and walking with him. And Mark pinned that because he walked with Peter. And all of this happened because Barnabas decided to disciple someone who was walking walking away from the mission that God had called us to. Here's all I want to say about that. Everyone needs a Barnabas, and everyone in the church needs to be a Barnabas. Who are we looking at in our lives that loves Jesus more than anything, finds the foundation of their identity in Jesus, and if we want our identity to be in Jesus, how are we allowing them to pour into our lives so that we continue to grow in who we are in Christ, continue to do the hard work of Christianity, to rest in who we already are in Christ through his work for us so that it begins to bear fruit in all of our lives as we walk in the freedom that God has called us to, who's pouring into you that all they're doing is pouring into you in a way that leads you towards desiring that. And if you don't have that, then you're going at it alone And you will end up, as we'll see in just a moment, having one foot in the world and one foot in the the gospel or in the church, and you will have a tendency to have a, a, a roller coaster of a life. You will not grow in the identity that you have in Christ. So who's pouring into you, but then also who are you pouring into? All of us in the church, if our identity is in Christ, we should have people pouring into us in a gospel-centered way, and we should be pouring into others in a gospel-centered way. Christianity is a team game. We are individually saved by God, but he brings us into a family, and we cannot walk this out without doing it together. Paul says, if your identity is in Christ, you disciple others and you are discipled. Justice, we know very little about, but here's what I want to say, because Paul mentions these three people who are Jews, and he talks about how they have comforted him. And Paul says, Justice and Mark and, um, and, and uh, Justice and Mark, and who else? Aristarchus have comforted me in their lives. So they have comforted Paul, and you need to know That for Paul, he had a hard life. He went through so many different things. He was beaten. He was imprisoned. He was tortured. He's writing this letter again from prison. And, And but he's saying, these men have comforted me. Here's what I want you to know. And here's what I want you to, uh, to, to challenge you to think about in your life. Paul says, I've gone through all of these difficulties, but I have not been alone. And here's what I need you to know. In your walk with Christ, life is hard. The trials will come. Things will be a mess. When we put our faith in Christ, yes, Christ turns our mess into his message. And he uses our trials. And he uses them for us to give testimony to his goodness. But it will be hard. 
but you need to know that when you are finding your identity in Christ and you're placing your community in the people of God, then you are never alone. You always have community. You always have people who love you. You always have people who are with you. And Paul says, life has been hard, but I am not alone. I have been comforted because I have the people of God around me. Then he says, Epaphras, he mentions him, just a couple more. He, he was likely the person who planted the church in Colossae. We talked about him in chapter 1. <clears throat> he was trained by Paul in Ephesus. So Paul spent years in Ephesus teaching. It's believed that Epaphras was taught by Paul in Ephesus and then went back home to Colossae to plant the church there. And here's what he says. That, uh, um, Epaphras was faithful in prayer and doing the word of God. Here's the challenge for us. If we're finding our identity in Christ, the natural thing that we should be in pursuit of, as we talked about last week, is going to God without ceasing, being a people of prayer, not only for ourselves, but for one another, but also, as James says, doers of the word. This is what Acts 6, 4 says the early church was doing. They were praying and they were practicing the word of God. See, Epaphras was not just coming to church and sitting down and leaving when it was over. He saw the needs of the church and he acted. That means he was actively building community. He was actively revealing the kingdom of God. He was actively re uh, revealing his identity in Christ through prayer and living out the word of truth. Our identity in Christ leads us to prayer and mission more and more and more. It's what we see from Epaphras. This is what the identity of Christ does for us. Then he says there are people whose special skills in the church need to be used for the glory of God. He mentions Luke. He says Luke is someone who leveraged everything he had for the kingdom of God. He was a Gentile. He was from Antioch. He was a doctor, also kind of dabbled as a reporter. He gives us the books of, of Acts and Luke and where he's just giving us investigative, reportive work. But he also was Paul's doctor. He traveled with him on, the, on Paul's missionary journeys and Paul needed a doctor a lot. It was hazardous to work with Paul and walk with him. So he needed a doctor and Luke was that one. And he gives testimony to the fact that he is living out the gifts that God has given him, the special skills that he has in life as a missionary position and, and really building up and revealing the identity that he has in Christ, not only to the church, but to the world. This is where the priesthood of all believers comes. So listen, it's not just my job or any other pastor's job here to build something beautiful here. I'm going to let that sit for a second. All of us are the church. It's on all of us. Some of us are called to different things. Might be called to be the pastor. Charles might be called to be a pastor. You might be called to do something different. You might be called to use what God has called you to in the marketplace to build the people of God and the church of God. But it takes all of God's people to build the church that God has called us to be. He gifts us in different ways. He give, opens up different doors. But all of us are the people of God, and it's on all of us to build the body of Christ that not only God longs for us to have, but we desire to have. And if you're not actively living out the things that God has blessed you with and the skills that he's given you and the talents and using the resources to give him glory, then a part of what's missing from this church body is you missing out on what God has gifted you in and called you to. And Luke is an example of that. It's what you are called to and what you're doing right now is no accident. It's strategic by God. He's given you the things that he's given you. He's put you in the places he's put you in all for his glory. And what we see here is in the church body, when we're building community and a church that is incredibly beautiful, not only for us, but for the world to see, it means that all believers are living out their faith where they live and where they work and where they play. And they are using what God has given them out of the identity they have in Christ to reveal and build up the church within its own walls and to the world around them. We need Christian doctors. And when you go to the hospital, don't check your Christianity at the door. We need Christian nurses. We need Christian construction workers, mechanics, accountants, teachers, parents, nurses, bankers, business owners, students, servers, dare I say politicians, artists, 
And not just, not just, it's totally fine if you feel called to this, but not just to say, hey, I'm going to start a Christian thing, but just be a Christian out in the world. Like reveal the gospel truth in the places that God has put you. This is how a city changes. I I quoted last week from Rodney Stark, who said the early church exploded, not because of pastors and missionaries, but because the people of God took the gospel truth where they lived and where they worked and where they played and where they learned. And the, and the, the community was completely transformed. Two more. He said, and this one's sad, this is a warning for us. He mentions Demas. Demas was one who loved the world and walked away from God, but unlike Mark, didn't come back. Listen, this happens so often. I just want to say this really quickly. I see this most of the time today when people buy into believing they need to purchase life and and security and meaning and, and everything that they desire, love and satisfaction in the things of the world. Or they believe that to love somebody in the world, to be an encourager to somebody in the world, they have to lay truth to the side. And I've seen this so often in the time that I've been a pastor And there's nothing more sad than justifying walking away from God because you're trusting your heart or a heart of a person that you love more than you trust God's heart and his truth. It is not a reason to walk away. Demas is the one who deconstructed his faith. It's not a new and novel idea. It's something that has always taken place. It's always been around. I have a lot to say here that I could say, but I'll have to wait for another time. But for the sake of of what we need to see here, if this is you, I want you to know that doubting is okay. We've talked about how doubt is actually a point of tension. It can can lead us into growth. It's like a poised foot when you're doubting and you lean into God and you seek the answers and you find the answers. Listen, God is not afraid of your doubt. And if you step in, then you will grow in him. And I've seen this happen time and time and time again. People walk away from their faith but they are honest enough to say, I will, I'll, I'll seek and I'll be open to what is true. And they come back into the faith, as has happened with several of my friends, and they've been, come into the faith stronger than they ever were before, trusting and revealing the identity of Christ more than they ever had before. Or doubt can be a poised foot that causes you to step backwards away from God and just walk away and be dishonest with yourself and not truly seek what is real and what is true. This person believes this and I love them, so I need to believe this to love them. And you don't lean into what could be true, you just trust your own heart or the heart of another and you step away and you walk away from truth. I read a couple of books from an atheist and he made some really good points and that's a good reason to lift your foot, but lean into the truths of who God is, seek answers in God and you will find them. And so here's how I want to encourage you. If you're doubting at all, I would love for you to come and talk to one of us pastors here at the church. We're here for you. We desire to talk to you. And my belief is that we can honestly seek out the truths of God and that you will find life in him. And you'll know how to encourage and love people out in the world and deal with different things that might cause doubt in your life. So lean into Christ. Come to a pastor. Talk to us. Paul, finally, he mentions... uh, Nympha, who's a woman, and we've got to be thankful for that, right? Finally, in this long list, we get a female, and she is the one that has opened up her house so that the church can meet in her house. Only thing I'll say here, some of you are connectors, some of you God has given a lot to, and and I just want to challenge you, how are you using the resources that you have, not only your skills like Luke and the places where you live, work, and play, but the things that you possess to reveal the glory of God and to build the people of God. This is what Nympha does. She opens up her house so that the church can meet there. And the resources that you have are great. Enjoy them, have them. They will not make you completely happy, but they can be fun. But it just shouldn't be your God. It should be a way to praise your God. And having everything in Jesus makes us open-handed with all that we have because we do not worship it, but we worship God with them. So ask yourself, do I steward what I have or does what I have own me? Do I live life with open hands? Am I seeking to reveal the truth of God? Because the gospel makes us a generous people. We have everything we need in Christ. 
And finally, Archippus, which is easily the weirdest name, but it's a very fitting ending. And I love how Paul put him last because here's what he says to Archippus. He says, tell Archippus to fulfill the work that he has received from the Lord. And this is such a fitting ending to the letter of Colossians. We've learned about the gospel. We've learned about grace. We've learned about what it means to find our identity in Christ and how we can live out that freedom. And then Paul's gotten really practical at how this identity looks as we begin to play it out and what we should pursue to walk in freedom and joy. And then he ends the whole thing by going, tell Archippus to fulfill what he has received, the calling he has received from the Lord. Translation, tell Archippus to get off his tail and do what God has called him to do. And I believe that's what he's leaving us with as we close out this book. What is God calling us to? What is he laying on our hearts? What's the next step? What do I need to do? What do I need to surrender? What, what, What do I need to pursue? What is it that I need to use to reveal the glory of God that I'm not doing now? What is it that I need to lean in and fulfill in my walk with God? How can I encourage others and how can I walk in the identity of Christ? Do it. Take the step. Make the decision. Fulfill what God has called you to. What are we waiting on? This is the identity of freedom. Step into that faith and experience the joy that you can only have in God. And he reminds us how. Remember my chains, aka the gospel is worth it. And remember the grace of God. It's all by his grace that we are who we are, that we can live how we can live, and that we can have the power to live it out in joy. Walk in it. God, thank you so much for the truth of your word. And this morning, Lord, I know that when we go through a text like this and there's just a list of names that we're trying to go through, it can feel, it can feel monotonous and it can just feel difficult to, to kind of wrestle with everything that is being said in the text. And so, Lord, I pray that you would just Allow our minds this morning to wrap around these things that you have called us to. The purpose that Paul put these people in this list and and told us who they were and what they did and what the people of the church in Colossae would have known of them and the encouragement that it would have been. And God, I pray that you would help us to be a people that come together as a church body and reveal these things to one another. I know that this is what all of us long for. We want this type of community where I can look to the person to my right and my left and I I can trust them. I know that they're dependable. I know that they're faithful. I know they want what's best for me. I know that they're going to point me towards the gospel truth in everything that I do and every decision that I make. I know they're going to encourage me but they're going to love me towards truth and desire transformation to look more like God and to reveal his kingdom in greater ways. These are all things that we want. So God, I pray that you would just push these these truths deep down into our hearts, transform our minds this morning. And whatever it is that the next step is that we need to take, God, I pray that we would feel challenged and encouraged by your word this morning to make that decision, to take that step. Maybe for some of us, it's to place our faith in Christ for the very first time. And and if they have not experienced the freedom of having salvation in you, I pray that right now, someone would place their faith in you. Maybe it's that we're holding on to too much of the world. Maybe it's that we have one foot in the, in the world and one foot in your, in your kingdom. And, and we need to make the decision to go all in on you, to find our life in you, to depend on you, to find our joy in you, to reveal you, to stop seeking and start revealing. To stop working for and start working from. God, it's the only liberty. And I just pray that as we close in worship this morning, you would just... Reveal to each of us the decision that we need to make and that you would give us the strength by your grace to make it. In Jesus' name, amen. As we close together in worship this morning, I want to invite you to partake in communion at any point during worship at one of our three stations. Um, We do this every week to remind us of who Christ is and what he's done for us. This is also the time to give of tithes and offerings. Let's stand together and let's worship.
stones move for good for the lamb conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs 